Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I begin, I sympathize with you. You've been sitting there for a long time. Why don't you stand up? Make some new friends, enemies, whatever you do. Take a minute. And if uh, the people that are organizing are maintaining the lights inside of this hall, if they can help turn them up a little bit because it's still far too romantic. Inshallah. Okay, have a seat. That's enough, okay? Before I begin also, I'd like to say just a couple of introductory comments. Um, I am extremely grateful and uh, proud of what has happened here this weekend. I was delighted to be a small part of the retreat that was put together by Mass and then of course this incredible convention. And before I leave tomorrow, I think I would be doing an injustice if I didn't say that I'm absolutely mesmerized by the level of organization, dedication, hard work, that so many old and young alike have put together in this organization to put this conference together for the benefit of all of us, and I think we owe them a round of applause. Um, it is a show of, it really is a show of very powerful spirit and what Muslim youth are capable of. Um, and subhanAllah, it's, it's a really great testimony to great things that come ahead. So I'm very, very proud of this organization. I'm honored to be a part of this convention. Uh, and really, speakers, I at least speak for myself, we do the easy part. Uh, you know, putting this stuff together in the way that they have uh, is, is literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of collective hours of work. Uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time away from family and from other obligations to put something like this together. The vast majority, if not all of the people that are involved are entirely volunteers, which means they've sacrificed time away from business, family, home, studies, and other things to do this. So for that, all of us collectively are truly, truly grateful. And we make dua for all of the volunteers and all of their families. I was uh, given the title uh, that suggests that we are proud, unapologetic, Muslim and American at the same time. And I think that we've heard a lot of very empowering messages this evening. I myself was sitting in the audience really mesmerized by what I've heard and also in, in the back, just listening to each one of those talks. And it really has been quite an inspirational evening for myself, even as an audience. What I wanted to share with you in this evening, I'll, I'll make my agenda very, very clear. When I think about a problem, my first inclination is to think about, just scour through whatever little, little knowledge I have of the Qur'an and think about a place in the Qur'an that I would go to when I think about a problem. And the place, given the situation we find ourselves in, one of the most inspirational places I would go to is the place that I would like to share with you. This is a small portion of Surah Ali Imran. And to give you a little bit of the backdrop of what it is that Allah is commenting on here, this is the aftermath of the Battle of Uhud, the second major conflict in Islamic history. The first of them was Badr and the second of them was Uhud. And in this battle, the Prophet ﷺ was almost killed. He actually fell unconscious, his face covered in blood, and a lot of companions actually thought he's been killed. And they were completely demoralized. Until it was discovered later on that he, was just, he had just fallen unconscious, he had a concussion, but he wasn't in fact killed. What happened thereafter is, of course, it was mentioned, Sheikh Abdul Nasser also alluded to the, the, the catastrophe of Badr. Seventy of the closest companions and the greatest of the companions were martyred uh, in this battle. And the Muslims had to actually retreat. At first they were winning, and because of a strange turn of events, the Muslims actually had to go and go into a retreat. And Qur'an captures that moment, إِذْ تُسْعِدُونَ وَلَا تَلْوُونَ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ وَالرَّسُولُ يَدْعُوكُمْ فِي أُخْرَاكُمْ When you were climbing up the hill, you weren't even turning back to look at anybody else. You were just making it for the hills to save your lives. And the messenger was actually still left behind, because a lot of people thought he had already died. So the messenger still left back on the battlefield, and the messenger then called you from behind. So catastrophe after catastrophe and emotional disaster on top of disaster struck you. You were, you, you were completely taken as if things couldn't get any worse. And then it, more news hit you like it couldn't get any worse on top of that. So this is a really deeply painful scenario in the Muslim community. But what's worse, after the Muslims make their escape, whatever Muslims have survived that have been deeply injured, they make their mistake. 
The Quraysh did not pursue them up the mountain. They spoke and they talked trash to the Muslims from the bottom of the mountain and talked about how they've won and they've been victorious and they left. And now the Muslims who've been demoralized, also been humiliated in a sense, are trying to gather their losses and barely able to stand up when the news comes that there's a rethought by the enemy. The enemy had left the battlefield, but the enemies, and we scouted them, we had intelligentsia keeping an eye on how far they went back, and they had a thought, well, you know, the Muslims are pretty injured right now, and they're pretty demoralized, so they're down for the count. So if we just come back and finish the job, this might be it, we might have to do this again. So the Quraysh thought, maybe we should just go back and finish the job. So even though they had left the battlefield, rumor came and actually good intelligence came that they're heading back to finish the job. And it's at that point that the Prophet ﷺ said, before they get back, we're going to get up and go after them. But he's not talking to an army that is deeply motivated and full of zeal and shouting takbirs. He's talking to an army that has seen, including his own uncle, slaughtered and, and, and really mutilated and he, they've seen some of the greatest warriors be annihilated. And on top of that, the ones that have survived, many of them are deeply injured, not to mention the demoralized situation that exists. And now the Prophet is saying, get up, we're going after the enemy. They just, not hours ago, they ran away from the enemy up the mountain. And now they're being told, get up, forget defense, we're going on the offense. That's what they're being told. And on that, in that scenario, companions that could barely stand up, got up. They stood up. They're bleeding themselves and they got up and basically came before the Prophet Sama'na We hear and we obey. Let's go. Let's move. These incredible human beings. And this was so powerful that Allah Azza wa Jal Himself decided to comment on this remarkable moment, timeless moment in history. And that's what I wanted to share with you. The relevance of it to our discussion is something I leave up to you. I will not spell that out for you. I want you to think for yourselves. Fihi dhikrukum. Quran is talking about you and your situation. How do these remarkable words apply to us? I will not elaborate. That is for you to decide. Yastabshiruna bi ni'matin min Allahi wa fadlin wa anna Allah la yudhi'u ajr al mu'mineen. Some people have died in the battlefield. They're already shuhada. And Allah says about those shuhada that they are already before in the company of Allah, enjoying themselves, full of happiness. And they're waiting for people that haven't yet joined them yet. And in the moments of their joy, they're anticipating more people are gonna make it into Jannah. We just lost 70 companions. Allah says those 70 people couldn't be happier. So don't be sad for them. They're really happy right now. And they are enjoying ni'matin min Allah wa fadl. They're enjoying the favor of Allah and on top of that additional blessings. And another thing that they're really happy about is wa anna Allah la yudhi'u ajr al mu'mineen. That they're, they're overjoyed. Now this is again two people, a group of people already in Jannah and a group of people in the world. I'm talking about the group of people that are already in Jannah. They're Enjoying what? They're enjoying one of the most amazing things I've ever read in the Quran. وَيَسْتَبْشِرُونَ You could say it's muttasil here. بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ They're overjoyed at the fact that Allah never wastes any of the compensation of believers. Whether win or loss, when you did something for Allah, whether you saw results or not, none of it ever went to waste. If I came to this conference to share something about Allah's book, sincerely, and one of you was sitting here or none of you was sitting here, my my reward is recorded with him. I have nothing to be upset about. Why is there half a hall? Why is there a full hall? That's irrelevant. We're clear about why we do things. And there are people in Jannah that are looking down at the situation and they're happy over the fact that none of what the believers go through is going unrewarded. So the people of Jannah are very clear and Allah mentions it so that the future people of Jannah become very clear. That they're not, their efforts are not going to go unrewarded. That they shouldn't think any less of anything that they do. By the way, in times of great trial, we start thinking, what is my little effort going to do? What is me helping out at a Sunday school or doing a little thing here and there at an MSA or being an Islamic school teacher or helping out in a relief organization? What is my little effort going to do? Every time I try to help a disaster cause, there's a disaster 10 times bigger around the corner. So I don't feel like I'm making any difference. That's when you need this ayah. Anna Allah la yudhi'u ajr al-mu'mineen. 
Allah will not waste the, the, the compensation of any of those who believe. May Allah make us from them. Those who responded to Allah and the Messenger even after deep injury had struck them, meaning they are down, they've been defeated, they're depressed, they're demoralized. They've been crushed by their enemy and they still respond to Allah and the Messenger. Qarh in the Arabic language is different from Jarh. Jarh is any injury. Qarh is an injury, is an injury that goes through your flesh and cuts inside of your bone. A deep gash injury. Not an easy one to heal. Maybe even a lethal one. These people that are deeply, deeply wounded still got up. No matter how badly wounded this ummah is, it will still get up. And these are the people, the people that are already in Jannah, Jannah are cheering on. They're, we're not alone. There are people that are waiting for us to join them and they're watching us. When we are hit with injury, they're happy because now, we're, now it's time for us to earn our Jannah. So we shouldn't be depressed when we're in injury, when we're hurting. When we're down, this is the time to earn Allah's greatest rewards. This is the time to celebrate. We have been honored to be put in this position. Those who can excel, who can find the beauty of this deen and still continue to do good and remain conscious and fearful only and only of Allah, those people are going to have great compensation. Those are the people that other people came to them and said, people have gathered against you. Everybody's against you. And they're, they're, they're gathering and uniting their forces. فَخْشَوْهُمْ You should be afraid of everything that's happening around you. فَزَادَهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ When they heard that everybody's gathering against them, they, that, that, that message made them even stronger in their faith. And they turned back to Allah and said, Allah is enough for us and He's enough to take care of everything we're going through. When we hear the message that people are ganging up on us, that is not a reason to lose our faith in Allah. The people of Jannah, when they hear that, their iman becomes even stronger. These are efforts that the enemy makes thinking that this will make the Muslims weaker. And Quran tells us that the people of the Quran, when you gather your forces, it will only make us stronger. Then those injured soldiers, when they came with the Prophet ﷺ, when they were not injured, they couldn't win. Can you imagine? And now they're injured and they're heading towards the enemy who's galvanized and motivated already. And they, the Quraysh heard that the Muslims, instead of running, are now coming towards us. They got scared and turned away. They got scared and they never met. There was no Uhud 2.0. It didn't happen. There was no rematch. And when the Muslims got there, the field was empty, they were gone. And when that happened, well, how did Allah describe it? They came back by the favor of Allah, by the blessing of Allah, by the luxury that Allah accommodated them. No harm touched them. And they followed only the pleasure of Allah. They went out there to make only and only Allah happy. They didn't go for victory. They didn't go to crush the enemy. They didn't go for revenge. The only thing before them was our messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said get up and go because that will please your your rabb that will please allah that's why they got up and allah said when people get up for me i will let no harm come to them wattaba'u ridwan allah wallahu dhu fadlin azim and dhu fadlin azim by the way is nakira here meaning it's not dhul fadlil azim there's no lam ta'rif here and there's a really interesting nuance to the text of the quran allah is the possessor of some great favor I didn't say the great favor, I said some great favor because it's nakira here. You know what that suggests? The way that Allah will favor this ummah is unknown. Right now you can't assess what that favor is going to be, but it's coming. And Allah is completely capable of bestowing it upon us. All that was was shaitan. That whole propaganda, that people are coming, they're gathering against you, they're going to come and get you, things are going to get a lot worse for you. All that was was shaitan, Allah says. يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ All he does is infill, instill the fear of his friends into you. He wants you to be scared of his friends. That's one interpretation of the text. But equally applicable is another interpretation of the same text grammatically. Which is, all that was is shaitan 
who only the people who are his friends get scared. So if you get scared, Quran is commenting, you become friends with who? Shaitan. Yukhawifu awliya'ahu. He's only successful in scaring his friends. So there's two things. He wants you to be scared of his friends, and if you do get scared, you just became friends with him. You just joined his party. Yukhawifu awliya'ahu. Fala takhafuhum wa khafuni in kuntum mu'mineen. Then don't be afraid of them. Be afraid of me if you in fact believe. Every time you and I stand in front of Allah, it's not just because we worship Allah. It's not just because we only believe in one God. That is also an acknowledgement that we fear no one but Allah. That we bow before no one but Allah. That we humble ourselves before no one but Allah. When every salah is a reminder that there is nothing else, no political circumstance, no rhetoric, no media, there is no bias against this, no crimes that are taking place that will instill the fear of anyone other than Allah in our hearts. That is an acknowledgement every time you and I stand in prayer. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ الَّذِينَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْكُفْرِ Allah is not done. He says, don't, don't let those who are making a lot of efforts to the, for the furthering the cause of disbelief, those who are making so many efforts to destroy Islam, those who are making so many efforts to make t turn believers into disbelievers, those who are making so many efforts to further kufr on the earth, disbelief and disregard of God on the earth, they make a lot of efforts, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of resources, they have a lot of tools. Don't let all of their efforts ever worry you. لا يحزنك الذين يسارعون في الكفر. This is a principle of the Quran. We have forgotten this principle. Ustad Norman, have you seen what they're doing on this website? Do you know this video that they made? Do you know what they said on CNN? Do you know what they said on Fox? Why don't you just recite لا يحزنك الذين يسارعون في الكفر? Don't let their efforts and their schemes and their propaganda ever worry you. إِنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِثْمًا We're only... إِنَّهُمْ لَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْءًا I love this part. إِنَّهُمْ لَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْءًا They, no doubt about it, can't harm Allah at all. <laughs> I'm baffled by this statement. Allah said, don't worry about their schemes and their plans and their plots and their propaganda. They can't harm who at all? They can't harm? Allah at all. I'm not worried about them harming Allah. I was actually kind of worried about them harming me. So I was expecting Allah will say, don't worry about their schemes, they won't harm you. But Allah says, what instead? Don't worry about their schemes, they can't harm Allah. Why is that? Because Allah is our protection. It's like Allah is our shield and they can't do anything about this shield. So you're safe because you're with Allah. You're with Allah. They can't harm Allah. So you have nothing to worry about. Then why is Allah giving them this opportunity to scheme and plot and further their cause and make things more and more difficult for the believers? Allah wants that they, they get nothing, not even a little bit of the akhirah. Meaning there are people that are evil and they want to continue to do more evil and undermine and, and continue the path of injustice and oppression, Allah says, I'd like to let you dig your hole a little deeper because that little good you have left in you, you don't even deserve it. Let you do your evil. Why are people so evil? Because Allah's punishment to them is He let them, let them have it. You want to go this way? Go ahead. Go ahead. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ They have great punishment standing before them. Instead of being afraid of them, the Qur'an makes us feel sorry for them. They're digging their own hole. Now listen to this part. Then he turns our, his attention to, within our own ranks. There are those who sold their, their belief with disbelief. There are those who under the pressure of the enemy said, this Islam thing is too much. I can't handle it. I can't handle, you know, the way people look at me, the way people think about me. I'd rather sell this off and be like everybody else who's disbelieved, so I'll fit in better. Allah says about them, What do you think? They're gonna harm Allah? They can't harm Allah at all. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ And they have painful punishment coming before them. This is about those who sell their deen. May Allah not make us of them. وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ خَيْرٌ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ Don't allow the disbelievers, the enemies of Allah's deen, don't allow the vicious enemies of the Prophet ﷺ to ever think. Don't you dare think about them that the stuff that they do 
is good for them. The extension Allah has given them is good for them. I'd like to give you an analogy here so it'll help you understand what's happening in this ayah. You have a, a rabid dog, uh, you know, a crazy dog, who goes and bites whatever. And then you, somebody says, why don't you just put it on a leash? And what Allah does is He puts this dog on like you could say a thousand foot leash. It's a really long leash. The thing is, for 999 feet, this dog thinks that it's running free. Doesn't it? If you put it on a one foot leash, it just, it can't move. But if you put it on a thousand foot leash, it's gonna run around and never feel like a choke. But Allah says, I only extend for them, release them, give them more room. You wanna, you wanna do evil stuff? You wanna do kufr stuff? Go ahead, do more. S try to hurt the cause of Islam more. Propagate lies against Allah's Prophet more. Say vicious things about the Quran more. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Because that same dog, when it's running full speed and it hits foot 1000, what happens to him? He gets choked, doesn't he? And that choke is way harder when he's running full speed than it would have been if it was one foot long. That's the plan Allah has for them. Let them dig their hole. Let them choke themselves. <inaudible> we only give them extension so they can earn more sins. Allah says, and they will have humiliating punishment. Why did Allah say they have humiliating punishment? Allah usually says great punishment, painful punishment, but this time He says humiliating punishment. Why? Because when they try to humiliate the deen of Allah, then the only fair punishment is that they shall face humiliating punishment. Then Allah turns His attention to you and me and says, مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَذَرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَى مَا أَنْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ Allah is not one to leave you alone in the state that you're in. Allah will not just leave you be and let you just think that you have faith. Until he can separate the good ones among you from the filthy ones. Some of you have filth inside of your hearts. And when the state of fear comes and the pressure comes and the stereotyping comes, some of you will abandon your faith and that filth in your hearts will, not, will take over whatever good you had in it. Allah says He will put you and I through terrible, difficult circumstances so He can separate the filthy from within the ummah. And, and cut them out. May Allah not make us see any of us from them. And Allah will never be one to inform you of the unseen. People come to the Shaykh, the Imam, the scholar. They come to, what do you think? When is all this fitna going to end? When are things going to get better? Allah says, Allah is not one to inform you of the unseen. I don't get to get, I'm not gonna say three more years, watch, everything's gonna be better. No, 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 no. That's actually what I've heard in churches. I go to church to hang out sometimes just to see what they do. I've been. And I, I actually, last Christmas, I just, I want to know how they do, they do da'wah. How did they get 100,000 people inside of a stadium and preach? So I went to listen. Well, what do these guys do? And they're like, this year is going to be a great year for you. The Lord's going to take care of everything. You're going to get yourself a promotion. And that divorce is finally going to be filed. And you're going to do great this year. Because the Lord promises it. I was like, what Lord promises this year is going to be great? You know, we don't have that in Islam. Like, is this year going to be better than next? When is Allah going to finish this fitna? Or when are things going to get better? Allah told us very clearly, so we're not deluded. And we don't even ask that question. Allah will never be one to tell you what's going to happen in the unseen. And the future of the Ummah is in the unseen. However, Allah does select from His messengers whoever He wants. Meaning Allah chose His messenger and decided to tell him what you need to know. Focus on what Allah told you and not what Allah did not tell you. Don't get, don't get obsessed with things that Allah Himself didn't give you. If it was valuable for you, Allah would have given it to you. So don't be so, so obsessive, compulsive about unnecessary details. Then, then just believe in Allah and His Messenger. And if you can continue to believe and continue to be fearful only of Allah, then you will have great punishment, what, well, great reward rather. What else do you want? Just have faith and be fearful of Allah. In the most toughest of times, Allah is telling you that's the only two things you're going to need. Everything else will work itself out. Don't focus on the problem. And finally, the advice to you and to me. This is the last thing I'm sharing with you, I promise. And don't you ever think about those who are cheap, greedy, miserly with what Allah has given them. 
that they hold on to what Allah has given them. Min fadli, from his own favor. They didn't earn it. That's a favor of Allah on them. Huwa khayran lahum. That that's good for them to hold on to their wealth. This is the time. This is the time where the young people, were gonna, they're going to have to give up their free time that Allah gave them. Their free time cannot go into eight hours of video games anymore. There's no time for you to watch the next Netflix and Amazon series. You don't have that kind of time. You're the Muslim youth. Allah has given you free time. Allah has given you talent. Allah has given you creativity. That creativity cannot go into you making stupid jokes on social media. It needs to be used in much more productive ways because these people who Allah has given wealth and luxury and opportunity and health and talent, when Allah has given all of these things and they're cheap and miserly with it, they only use it for themselves. What does Allah say about them? That they think they get to use it for themselves is good for them? It's bad for them. The very things they were cheap with, the very things they were greedy with for their own are the very things that will be turned into a rope around their necks, choking them on the day of resurrection. That time, that ni'mah, that rizq that Allah gave you, that you didn't put to the right cause, is going to come and choke you on the day of resurrection. May Allah not make us of them. وَلِلَّهِ مِرَاثُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Man, what a thing to say. Allah alone owns the entire inheritance of the skies and the earth. What in the world is inheritance doing here? Allah is tell, reminding you and me, whatever you own, whatever I own, whatever I enjoy in this life, I'm not going to get to keep it. At the end of the day, I'm going to be in the ground and somebody else will be driving my car. I'm going to be in the ground and somebody else will be wearing my clothes. And by the way, they won't be driving it for that long either. They're going to be in the ground too. Somebody else will be living in that house a hundred years from now. Somebody else is going to be, you know, you know, eating the fruit of that tree that I have in my backyard. It's not going to be mine. And at the end of it all, all of it will be given in inheritance back to Allah. It's Allah's. Because everybody will be gone. Understand the temporal nature of the material world. Do not become materialistic in your goals, in your aspirations. Things Allah Azza wa Jal is offering us in a time of great fitna, the only thing to worry about is what you will earn with Allah. Put your efforts in this world, excel, do your very best. But then again, if that's all you want to do for this life, then that is what, he, what is exactly choking you. It's going to choke you. It's going to destroy you. Our deen is so beautiful. Such a balance between what we, what we want in the next life and what we get in this life. It, it, it merges the two of them. We're not just people of akhirah and we're not just people of dunya. We're people of Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. And so Allah Azza wa concludes as I conclude in this passage, Wallahu bima ta'amaluna khabir. And Allah has full news and full account and a full perspective on everything that you're doing. And that's a comment to the Ummah. I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing when you've been hit with injury. I know whether or not you are becoming people of Jannah. I, I sincerely, I, I remind myself and I remind all of you that this Quran is a living document. It's a living, living book. It, it will inspire, it will empower, sometimes it will scare, sometimes it will set you straight and calibrate you. It is not a drug, like you know, in modern philosophy, religion is the opiate of the masses. So you, feel, you, you, you turn to religion to feel better about yourself. Yes, the book of Allah will make you feel better about yourself. But sometimes you just need to get a slap in the face and get set, set out straight. And the book of Allah will give you that too. It'll give you what you need, because Allah is your Rabb. He's your master. He doesn't have to cater his message to what might make you feel better. He'll cater the message to what you need, what your heart needs. And this time Allah is basically telling the ummah in the middle of this crisis, grow a spine, get strong. Don't be afraid of anybody else. Prove yourself to Allah and none of the efforts you do will go unacknowledged. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a courageous ummah and make the young people that are, that are no doubt going through trials that I as a youth in America did not go through. Their trials are much harder than mine were. May Allah Azza wa Jal make them a source of confidence and a revival of this faith for the ummah around the world, really around the world. I make so much dua for the youth in America, the Muslim youth in America, that they are the light 
light by which there will be nur spreading all over this ummah. And so many of them are sitting in this audience. My duas are with you. My prayers are with you. I'm so, so very proud of you. So what if you've made mistakes in the past? So what if you haven't realized your potential in the past? That's okay. You're still breathing, which means Allah still has hope in you. If you were a lost cause, you wouldn't be breathing anymore. The fact that Allah has given you life is because Allah expects things from you. It's a new day, it's a new beginning, and let us prove ourselves before Allah Azza wa Jal and show Him what goodness we can bring into this world. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.